demand. Oh, well, it my says. business is streaming now, so. Nice. It's, you, you all got a message? Yeah, it says yeah, we're streaming we're, live we're streaming on Facebook. Live. That is exciting because that means that it's Mutants and Masterminds Monday and we get to party with woo, Amber Scott has joined, Crystal and Steve. Amber, hello, how are you? Hi, great, thanks for having me. Crystal and Steve, you two, plus myself, plus the entirety of the Green Ronin crew have been hard at work over the last three days. Yep. Yes. Working our little zoom fingers to the bone. Yep, hidden away what? at an undisclosed virtual location. <laughs> That's right, yeah, <laughs> hidden, hidden deep below our um, our lair, um, which is located um, beneath an active volcano. As all good layers are. Of course. Yeah. So it's a, it's been our summit and the summit is a time when we get together and we talk about all the things that are coming up. Um, uh, we you are could all... say we sum it up. Ah. You just gave me Couldn't chills. That was that. beautiful. <laughs> I was trying to make it fun about being under the volcano and being on the summit at the same time. Didn't mm -hmm. come together. Crystals was better. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like it. And I'm looking forward to uh, even more of that as we continue on our today's adventure, uh, Mutants and Masterminds Monday. Folks are just sort of rolling in a bit um, as we sort of do a little pre-show patter to get everybody uh, up and running. Uh, I'm your disembodied voice, Troy, and I'll be monitoring the chat and answering, ignoring and or lying to you about the questions you ask. Um, it's your guess as to which one of those um, uh, options you've received. And um, Crystal and Steve, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you while I start to kind of check in on mm -hmm. folks. And um, we can kind of uh, have some dialogue as we wait for everyone to join us. Uh, well, hi, everybody. Uh, obviously, this week we've got Amber Scott, the author for uh, last week's Astonishing Adventure release, Three Made One. She wrote the capstone for the Nether War. And... Mm -hmm. I think kind of knocked it out of the park. Oh, thank you. Uh, and we are, I mean, Amber's got a very long track record for writing amazing adventures. Uh, she's worked mm -hmm. for Green Ronin. She's worked for Wizards of the Coast. She's worked for Paizo. I mean, you you were writing adventures for Dungeon Magazine back when that existed as a physical book. Just, so. just one adventure actually for Dungeon. That's kind of a funny story, Ooh. but maybe we'll get to that later. Hmm. All right. So Amber, would you say adventures are really one of your fortes? I love writing adventures. There's something about, I've always been the person who wants to be the GM as opposed mm -hmm. to the player. And I think it's just because I've always been a storyteller. I started writing when I was just a kid and I always kind of knew that I wanted to be a writer and sharing stories and helping people have fun and have a good time is mm -hmm. just something that I really love to do. And so once I got into adventure writing, it really hit that sweet spot for me where I get to come up with all these ideas of how can people have fun? How can people tell a really good story? What's gonna be exciting and cool to happen in a game? And even when I write non-adventures, when I write you know, supplements, say for a world setting, mm -hmm. I always like to put little ideas in so that a GM who's reading the book might think, oh, that's a great idea. I could turn that into adventure. You know, I, I'm always just, have that end goal of uh, what the game experience is going to be and how the players are going to have fun with it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Nice. So speaking as a, a, a storyteller, I find one of the, the, the balance, challenging balances <laughs> in terms of adventure writing is, is striking that balance between setting opportunities for really cool scenes to happen without necessarily getting so attached to that scene that it has to happen in the yeah. adventure in some, in some particular way, you know, that's, that's different from writing, say, uh, uh, you know, writing a story, writing, writing uh, a short story or a novel. Um, how do you strike that balance in your, your adventure design? It's definitely tricky. You know, there's an old joke that says, I want to run a game, but I want to be all the players and the GM and come up with all the stories and make it all happen perfectly. And then later the same person's like, oh, I've been informed that's called writing a book. Writing a novel, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> which I also like doing because mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. I like to be in charge. What can I say? <laughs> but it is important to always be thinking that number one, all game groups are not going to be like my group. 
and not everyone is going to have fun the same way that I do. And mm -hmm. I think keeping an open mind and trying to communicate with a lot of different gamers, for one thing, you know, being on forums, being plugged into what's happening in the industry and seeing what kind of new games are out there expands my horizons for what people are enjoying mm -hmm. right now. And always keeping in mind, uh, so I, I like to merge in my personal life, or I guess just my life, I like to merge business and writing. It's one of the fun things mm -hmm. that I like to do using a definition of fun that maybe only applies to me. <laughs> and I'm really into project management. And one concept in project management is the critical path where it's like, if something on this path breaks, we don't get an end product. Mm -hmm. And that's been applied to video game design as well, where a critical path is all the main quests that you have to go through to get to the end of the game and everything else is optional. So when I look at a tabletop adventure, it's kind of the same where I look at the critical path and think what could break here that would ruin the experience for everyone or ruin the plot of the story for this group. And the first adventure I ever had published, which was that one dungeon adventure, was called Urban Decay. And it was about a were-rat guildmaster taking over a city. And in the, one of the early scenes is the players could try and get information from asking around and making like diplomacy checks. Mm -hmm. This was in 3.5, I think. Mm -hmm. And when I started writing it, I was like, if the players make their diplomacy check, they find out this information. And if they don't, mm -hmm. And then I had to stop and think, and if they don't, then what happens? I can't just mm -hmm. say they don't get the information. So right. the adventure's over. Like, then what do they do? <laughs> so, I can't, so I said, if they get, if they make their check, they get the information. If they fail their check, they still get the information, but the wear rat becomes informed that they're asking questions and he sends some bad guys to like rough them up. Mm -hmm. And I got a ridiculous amount of like compliments on that. Like people at conventions <laughs> would be like, I love that. Like that just mm -hmm. told me like you were paying attention and that you, you knew like how to keep the story going forward. Like so many GMs came up and said, I've read so many adventures where it's like, this doesn't happen and then the game's over. Right. <laughs> and uh, right. a good example in Three Made One is in the, uh, I'll try not to spoil anything for people who might be watching mm -hmm. Thank you. play this, but the first sort of scene in the adventure has to do with the players figuring out a mystery and being, being misled and eventually putting clues together and figuring things out. And I knew from people I'd played with in the past, that might not be fun for everyone. Either they'll be like, well, this is ridiculous. My character would obviously know what's going on. Like it, it's obvious, mm -hmm. or that would simply not be a fun setup for them. Mm -hmm. And so I put a little sidebar in that said, if your players figure this out right away, or they just you know make their first role and they're like, oh, this is clearly that, that's okay. They can just move right on to this point this section doesn't rely on you tricking the characters or the characters mm -hmm. being completely bamboozled by the setup. Mm -hmm. The focus is on getting past the mystery, not in investigating the mystery. And so that's where I kind of try to look for how to keep the adventure moving on and to keep the story rolling and fun for the players. So we've got some comments here from folks. Um, Apoop says, <laughs> the concept of the critical path is a great expression of that idea. That's useful. Thank you so much. Oh, well. uh, yeah. Jay Grace says, I love the, the failing forward concept. That is sort of, uh, for me personally, the mm -hmm. definition of my career. Um, <laughs> Casey Butt says, I am waiting to hear back from a video game shop to tell me when to start. Then I can begin buying all this cool stuff. Oh, congratulations, Casey. And that's exciting. We okay. certainly love hearing that you're coming into money. Mm -hmm. Uh, Charlotte's, oh, Charlotte, I won't read that, but thank you so much. You're very kind. Jay Gray is our link wizard, sharing all kinds of good links to, uh, to Amber's work. And then, um, let's see what else we've got here. Yep. Oh, this, yep, you are not too late, everybody, is arriving here. Uh, Laura uh, says, Amber is so well-spoken and truly understands the root of a well-run game. Oh, thank yeah. you. Uh, yeah. There's oh, a let's... reason. Go oh, ahead, there's please. a reason we used to fight over her at... Uh... <laughs> back when I was working on Pathfinder. Mm -hmm. I love it. So Amber, we like it too when we get folks like you here because your fans are, um, you know, are really nice. Um, our fans are too. That isn't to say they aren't, but uh, we like adding new friendly folks to our, to our fandom. I really appreciate it. I mean, it's such a, you know, I've done work in video games. I've done work in fiction writing 
and other industries as well. And I always come back to tabletop uh, because it's such a welcoming, fun and inviting industry. Uh, I never would have got to where I am without so many people helping me on the way. And I just love that I can, you know, give back. And mm. there's yeah. a stereotype in gaming uh, that I totally follow, which is often I forget to invoice my projects. Uh, <laughs> it's because <laughs> It, it feels weird to get paid, honestly, for doing so. I mean, I still do want to get paid, uh, but- <laughs> And what's your projects, everyone? Yes. But, it, you know, it is more fun than work in a lot of ways. You know, mm -hmm. one of the themes that runs through when we have guests that speak to sort of their experience and some of the things that they, the people that they interact with and how their the genesis of their career sort of kicked off, um, uh, there's a theme and that is, don't be a jerk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, and I think that that's, uh, definitely oversimplifying it to a degree, but it's, you know, the, there are so many great people out there right now. Uh, and I know there are a few who are watching us and, and even in commenting, um, what are some thoughts you might have to those folks as they're sort of exploring that, turning something they love so dearly and that have been such a central part of their life into something that then they start getting a paycheck for, um, how, how do you maneuver that? Or how would you recommend a person think about that as they sort of pursue a career? You know, it's, it's difficult because when I started writing, there was a lot of avenues open that aren't right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Like the magazines is where I broke in and they're like print magazines at least don't really, aren't really an option anymore. Yeah. But there's also a lot of new avenues that are open that weren't available to me back then, which is social media, for example, and being able to follow your favorite creators on their social media accounts. Um, being able to attend online conventions. I love going to conventions and it's always been a great resource for me in getting uh, new contacts and networking and getting projects. All my original projects came through conferencing. And mm -hmm. while the world is kind of upside down right now, it is an opportunity to go to some of your favorite conventions in a virtual sense. And though it's not the same, it will give you uh, an opportunity to see how the industry kind of works on the inside. Don't be a jerk is great advice. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that advice. And it's true. Um, just being professional and being respectful of people's time while you're putting yourself out there. Mm -hmm. I feel like now might be a good time for that Dungeon Magazine story I promised like five minutes mm. ago. I was going to try and build it up a little more <laughs> than that, but whatever. Do you uh, we could put a fanfare in? Sure, yeah, I imagine there's a little drum roll now or like some right. cool like smoke coming off. The I've been working on my fanfare noise. You want to hear it? Yes, I do. Do, 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 do. Wow. You like that? Really been practicing. That was really I have funny. been. It's really been. Yeah, it's been a lot of work. Um, so I went to my first and only ever Dungeon Magazine adventure. Mm -hmm. I'd written for Dragon for a while. And I'd had a, a bunch of Dragon articles published. I knew the Paizo crew because I started writing for Dragon when it was under Paizo's sort of umbrella. Mm -hmm. I knew the crew pretty well. And I went to Gen Con and I want to say it was like 2006, maybe somewhere around there. And I went to a seminar called Writing for Dungeon Magazine because I would have liked to write for Dungeon Magazine and I had mm -hmm. not yet. I went with some friends and we... Um, we get to the seminar and it was Eric Mona, James Jacobs, and I think a couple other people. I'm just going to stick with Eric and James for now because I'm pretty sure of them. And the structure of the, the structure of the panel was Eric basically said, let's, you know, throw out a villain. What's a good villain? And somebody said, where at? And he's like, okay, where at? And he wrote it down on like the whiteboard. And then mm -hmm. he would go, what are some of the monsters this were rat could use? Nobody can say dire rats. Uh, why is this were rat, you know, doing something? What's his, his goal, you know? And we group wrote this query. And at the end of it, Eric said, this is a good query. Anyone who wants to should write it up, you know, put your own spin on it, mm -hmm. email it in, say you were at this seminar and we'll pick the best one and we'll pick someone to write it. And I was like, that's so cool. Like I've been wanting to get into Dungeon Magazine. This right. is clearly the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. And then I started second guessing myself. And I thought, well, you know, I already know the Paizo guys. Like I know them personally now. I write a lot for Dragon Magazine. They know who I am. Like maybe I'm taking away an opportunity 
maybe somebody else mm. is like just looking to break in and this was going to be their big shot and then me fancy big time dragon rider comes in and like snipes it so maybe i should just step back you know maybe that's the the nice thing to do so i was feeling all like warm and altruistic and i was chatting uh with the guys after the panel and i told them this line of reasoning mm -hmm. and as i'm explaining myself eric's just like smiling and nodding and I get to the end of my like little train of thought and Eric goes, yeah, nobody ever sends in the query. Oh. And I was like, what? Really? He, he goes, we do this panel every year and we do it at like SoCal and Winter Fantasy and nobody ever sends in the query. And oh. I was like, what? No, that doesn't make any sense. I was like, you're wrong, Eric. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I think we've all uttered that phrase, but. I I was like, well, you know, everyone spent all this money to come to Gen Con and they just spent 90 minutes in a seminar called How to Write for D Dungeon Magazine, right. run by the editor of Dungeon Magazine. And you're like, here's how to write for Dungeon Magazine. Like you'll be inundated with queries. Huh. And he's like, no, everyone talks themselves out of it. They think they're not going to be creative Aww. enough, that I was kidding. They won't be able to deliver, that hmm. they will sound unoriginal or whatever, but. It's so sad that people take all the reasons I actually don't write and they think <laughs> that means they can't write. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's ridiculous. Like if nobody else is gonna write it, I will. And so I went mm -hmm. home and I wrote the query and I sent it in and a couple, you know, a month later or whatever, I think James Jacobs was the one who wrote me back and said, you were the only one who sent it in, you get the job. <laughs> and I wrote the adventure and they published it and then like fourth edition happened like a month later and the, the magazines went away. So that was the one and only adventure I had. And it's because I was like, you know, screw it, I'm gonna do it. If, mm -hmm. I'm, just gonna, yeah. I'm just gonna take people at their word and I'm gonna put yeah. myself out there and do it. And that's like the best advice I have. Like be polite about it, don't be aggressive and don't be a jerk. But mm -hmm. everyone in this industry is so willing to help and you are better than you think you are. If you put your your work out there, you'll find a home for it. Mm -hmm. That's a great yeah, story. That's also yeah, that's thank you. It's that's also amazing. sort of a lesson in do the thing. Like if that's yeah, if you got that opportunity, grab it and be be engaged. You know, something else I wanted to add as well, with Justin and I, I'm always forever grateful to our mutants and masterminds um, community. Uh, when you're looking at a way to sort of get into spaces and, and engage in the hobby that you love. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know, there should be a stronger word than hobby. Um, it's a lifestyle for sure. Um, but, um, you know, We're in not this tier time, one imports, Troy. <laughs> right? I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sort of a, uh, a world, uh, a store that we can, you know, uh, all work at together and, and, uh, and become rich and famous, um, because that certainly is the way it works. But, um, these are chaotic times. And if you are a contributor to this stuff, if you're a contributor to what makes things work and what mm -hmm. makes things fun and joyful, you're going to find opportunities that kind of bubble up to the top and, you know, go after them. That is, um, this is really, really great advice. There's some folks here as well. Mm -hmm. that, um, uh, Jay, uh, Jay Gray, our Link Wizard says, that is almost the most inspiring thing I've heard and very much needed to hear it lately. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Um, uh, Laura says, that is an awesome and inspirational story. Just apply yourself. No harm in it. Thanks, Amber. <laughs> That's a very good story. Yeah, agreed. And, uh, you know, there's the flip side of that too, just to sort of help people one of the things too I'm imagining is learning how to take rejection or those sorts of things in stride. Mm -hmm. Do you have some thoughts on when things maybe don't connect, but lead to, you know, uh, greater opportunities moving forward? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a cliche, but it's true. You're going to face a lot of rejection when you put yourself out there. And it, it, it's not that it never gets easier. It does. But I think one thing that people don't talk about is that there's a lot of different kinds of rejection. Mm. <laughs> and when I started writing for Dungeons and Dragons, uh, I wrote a series for um, Dragon Magazine called Class Acts they used to have. Mm -hmm. I love that series. Yeah. yeah, so I wrote a lot of Class Acts and I wrote a lot of ecologies. So ecology of the will of the wisp, mm -hmm. ecology of the lizard folk. And the first few times I put articles out, it was like, ugh, you know, I'd get this pit in my stomach and I'd be so nervous and mm -hmm. read everything a million times, which you should do anyway. But, and then as I got better at them and I published more, 
I could just bang them out and I'd be like, oh, I've got like a million great ideas. And uh, that was some of the most fun I, I had writing. Actually, those ecologies were some of my favorite articles. Ecology of the Will of the Wisp was such a cool article. And it was one mm-hmm. of my early ones. Um, Ecology of the Lizard Folk too was just like really, really fun. It's weird to think of you being nervous about writing because I still think of you as the well-polished, confident writer who held my hand through like all my panic attacks with my first, writing my first adventure. Mm -hmm. Well, (laughs) number one, you're like a really good writer, Crystal. So just saying that. (laughs) And it's pretty easy to hold your hand when you're already (laughs) really good. But but no, I was totally nervous. And then as I got better at it, Mm -hmm. I got less nervous and I figured out how things work, you know, how... Uh, the process works and then it wasn't mysterious and then it was easier then suddenly I get my first adventure wow now all the butterflies are back how do I do this Ooh, I'm all over the place now I'm pretty good with adventures like my first even Pathfinder adventure path was pretty nerve-wracking especially since I was the first woman to have a cover credit for Mm. adventure paths so I really wanted to you know do a good job and I get I it's probably my most one of my most popular things that I've ever written. I still, you know, I get a lot of great comments on the World Wound Incursion and people being like, oh, I love that adventure. Mm. And, you know, then I got pretty good at that. So now like I can get a little nervous uh, for something like um, Three Made One. I don't have a big background in mutants and masterminds. And so I am like, oh, you know, I hope I get all the mechanics right and things like that. My favorite thing about Three Made One is that I have an in text call for a knowledge philosophy check so like that mm-hmm. one person who took knowledge philosophy as their skill is like yes it's my, time to, <laughs> my time to shine <laughs> uh, yeah I wanna, and then, you know so now i'm pretty good with that but you know i just wrote my first novel well not my first novel but the first novel i'm really trying to get published mm-hmm. and the rejection has been brutal it's been really hard and yeah. i've definitely gone into a dark place a couple times where i'm like maybe this isn't right for me. Maybe I'm a crappy writer and eventually it'll get better, but Mm -hmm. it's just picking yourself up every time that you start to feel yourself fall down again, supporting, surrounding yourself with supportive people like me and Crystal. We'll just bump through the... (laughs) We have a, we have a couple. You are a glorious writing gazelle. Mm -hmm. You are an elegant writing unicorn. Oh, we both went for unicorn. (laughs) Okay. Oh. Mm, I like it. I like it. Well, and I also want to say that the um, that our chat is also saying um, they are all great fans of both of you. Um, Jay Gray Link Wizard says, mm-hmm. "Can we get a collective congratulations for the first female cover credits for Amber E. Scott?" Mm-hmm. So, absolutely, congratulations. That's it's not nothing. And um, so congratulations to you for that. And then something that Alex says, Alex Thomas, um, a, a dear, dear friend and contributor to um, our Green Ronin effort says, that is crazy to hear from Crystal because she's the one who makes me feel better when I feel like a bad writer. Mm-hmm. Um, oh no, I think new that things there's, are scary. Yeah. And I think yes. that there's a truth here, no matter who you are in the world, it is important to have people to check in with to tether to mm-hmm. and sort of say does this look as bad as it you know as uh, i think it is <laughs> yeah as i'm feeling about it for sure mm-hmm. um a, a question in, um that comes up uh, david uh, body brings up something i have a, I have lots of cool ideas but no writing skill i need to learn to keep it simple and straightforward mm-hmm. how do you um balance sort of uh, people with amazing phenomenal ideas mm-hmm. how would you encourage them to sort of hone that writing skill uh, aside from like finding crystal and giving her all your writing and making sure (laughs) that's a joke (laughs) but uh what what would we share as far as advice goes for people who are feeling a little soft in the in the writing department um there's a lot of concrete things i can actually recommend that have helped me over the years um the standard advice is sort of to like read a lot of what you're going to write because you will absorb the good lessons and that's definitely mm-hmm. uh, a couple of years ago I got on Goodreads which is like that app it's like a social app for tracking the books that you read yep. and you can set yourself like a personal reading challenge and I was like oh that's fun I'll set myself to whatever 12 books like I clearly read at least 12 books in a year and then mm-hmm. it was that like November and I'd read like three and I was like when did I stop <laughs> being a reader like, oh my mm-hmm. gosh. 
And so now I make reading a priority and it's, it's been very fun. And it's kind of sad that I have to like schedule writing into my life, but I guess that's what being in your forties is like. <laughs> um, so reading obviously in the stuff that you want to write and outside of it too, you can get inspiration mm -hmm. from a lot of places. So reaching outside your genre, reading popular books and not popular ones and you know, TV and movies and things like that, indie publications, comic books mm -hmm. and game books. On a, on a more like technical level, outlining is something that I've recently fallen in love with. If you think you have a great idea and you start writing and then it kind of peters out, start with even a very simple outline and it can help you focus your thoughts. And there's a lot of different ways. If you go online and Google like snowflake method or mm -hmm. um, beat sheet method, you'll find different ways of outlining. I like beat sheets myself, which I think came originally from Save the Cat writes a novel, which I haven't actually read, but I think that's where it came from. And another idea is, um, I just had it. <laughs> well, a different idea that wasn't that one, but it is also an idea is to just start writing. Mm -hmm. Once you've got a bit of an outline, go ahead and it's okay if the words are bad. Something mm -hmm. like NaNoWriMo, where you can sort of challenge yourself to just write 50,000 words in November. Um, right. that's, that's short for National, National Novel Writing Month, if anyone's not familiar with that. It's been very helpful for me. Yeah. I also, if I get, if I start writing and I get stuck, I'll just write deliberately bad prose and come back and fix it later mm -hmm. um which sometimes has hilarious side effects like <laughs> the last mutants and masterminds adventure i wrote before three made one uh and i'm totally blanking on the name sorry crystal but it was the one with the t-rex the oh uh guy. rise of the tyrant rise of the tyrant. rise of the tyrants yeah. thank you so part of the adventure is the players get clues from the um the kind of <laughs> Riddler -esque. It was a white, yeah, a conundrum. Yes. Conundrum. Conundrum, thank you. Yes. I kept the kids starting with a P. I'm like, psych something. Anyway, conundrum. And so he leaves riddles for the players and they have to figure it out to come find him at a secret lair. And I got to that part in my draft and I was like, I don't know what to put for a riddle. Like, you know, with riddles is hard. So mm -hmm. I just wrote some placeholder text and like kept going. Mm -hmm. Well, I forgot about that. And I almost, I was like this close <laughs> to sending it to Crystal. <laughs> <laughs> and I did a final read. And at that point, it's like the players find a note and it says, ha ha, losers, come find me at the amusement park. <laughs> <laughs> this is the advice you gave me too when I was struggling. But the... But it came out for me as just like writing the first page is basically a profanity filled, yes. angry, mm -hmm. just stream of consciousness, yes. like rant about the plot. Yep. I, I, I will literally do that. I'll be like, I hate this project. It sucks. Yep. No one's ever going to believe this. And then it, it's like it just unlocks mm -hmm. that dam. Mm -hmm. And then I start writing normally after a while. Just remember to go back and fix the beginning. Right. Send it in. Do not send that to your poor, long suffering right. editor. Yes. <laughs> and on this that is why topic. revisions are important. If you get fortunate enough in this business to work <laughs> with an editor who will give you feedback, on your work, treasure it for the gift that it is. <sighs> oh, so and so you're basically uh, talking about not taking that kind of feedback personally, but kind of rolling Ooh. with it and interesting. Nope. Yeah, that's an art form I'm imagining to, to get to a point Editing, where you- That absolutely is. Yeah. Editing is one of those jobs, uh, th there are certain jobs in the world that are only noticed in their absence. Mm -hmm. uh, and editing is one of them. Uh, no one ever looks at something, at a piece of text and says, oh, this is so well edited. Um, but, <laughs> right. but you certainly know when it's not. Yeah. Oh, editors are absolutely worth their weight in gold. Like yeah. I, yeah. that is absolutely 100%. If I was in text right now, I'd put that little 100 emoji. Mm -hmm. that's, that's good and nice. Send yeah. your editor flowers and cookies. Yep. Yeah, interestingly enough, like um, I, I, I'm wondering too, as we look at what are these supporting sort of structures around people who write, um, you know, if maybe you don't necessarily have to be the most phenomenal writer to be able to kind of edit and do some of that stuff. Um, those are, are pretty different skill sets. Are there some other support 
sort of uh, functions like an editor that, uh, or people that you really depend on to kind of get you cr across the line? Because, you know, writing oh. sounds solitary, but for this kind of stuff, there, there are other people involved, right? Sure. There are a lot, yeah, of, a yeah. lot of writer, writers have beta readers, mm -hmm. you know, where we'll read each other's text. Mm -hmm. We'll just be like, hey, I've written this thing. Will you take a look at it? Uh, sort of a thing. Uh, just because it's helpful to have another pair of eyes sometimes look at something yeah, I, I'd also argue that spouses are like a writer's <laughs> bread and butter because mm -hmm. most yep. of my best ideas come from my wife. And even when they don't, my wife is the one like holding me when I cry over how terrible at this I am and telling mm -hmm. me that, no, I'm lying to myself. Mm -hmm. My yeah. experience has always been that spouses and dear friends will always be the ones to be like, Wow, you're way overcomplicating this. Yeah. Sure. And you trust them. Yeah. And you trust them a bit more to give you critical feedback and still love you. I mean, that's, you mm -hmm. know, that's great. Yeah. Uh, David uh, Body says, um, and, for, and pardon me, David, if I'm butchering your name, that is my superpower. For world building and adventure writing, where do you begin writing? An outline? Uh, yes. And that's actually that thing that I was going to say that I forgot. Uh, when it turns, job, when it comes to getting, yeah, good job, Troy. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, when it comes to adventures specifically, but it, it's also helpful in outlining. I did some work. Um, I was a judge for RPG Superstar one year when people were sending in mm. uh, um, like one page adventure summaries. Mm -hmm. And the advice I came out of that experience with that I use in my own writing now is when I go to start an adventure outline and often with even like fiction outlines, the first sentence I write is, the adventure begins when the PCs, dot, dot, dot. Because mm -hmm. so many of the summaries I got were like three and a half paragraphs of backstory. Backstory. Yep. Blizzard and how he got his tower and you know the name of his cat and things like that. And then at the end it's like, <laughs> and then the players come and they investigate the tower or whatever. Right. But that's the reverse when you're running mm -hmm. a game is you've got, you've got to get the players involved and you have to figure out how their characters are going to interact with the story. So by starting with that line, um, the story begins or the adventure begins when the PCs do this and then going from there, it helps me organize my thoughts in a much more natural format for writing mm -hmm. that full adventure. I love it. So some folks here are are, uh, are resonating with the, with the things that are being said. Stephen Jones says, um, my husband is a godsend. Jay Gray says, my spouse sits there and repeats the phrase, just get it on paper, then worry. Just get it on the paper, then worry. And That's David says, sense. it's B D Bo D. Hopefully I'm saying that right. But there you go. Um, uh, I, I, I'm certain that was entirely correct, David. But uh, go ahead, Crystal. Oh, uh no, I was going to say that's a good spouse, but if we're on mm -hmm. that, if we're back on that track, I also want to add that community managers are yes. godsends. Yes. Like if, whether they're handing your message boards or your social media or your email or whatever, the people who protect your poor, fragile writer ego. Community managers stand on the wall and protect the realm of the, the gentle introverts <laughs> who just want to be creative. <laughs> Steve, you said that earlier today in our summit, and I, and it made me just a bit misty, um, primarily because you know that is you start to feel so protective of your uh, of the of your team and the people that you work with, and then when you see unfair sort of um, uh, characterizations or people that maybe who knows what they've got going on in their life and maybe they're not being the best human being in the world, um, it can be um, you know you start to get to, I like to call it getting mama bear, like you were ready to mm -hmm. just sort of shred people apart. But, um, but yeah, I'll tell you, um, Green Ronin is uh, such a phenomenal space because people do understand there are these um, disciplines that are here to help and kind of integrate into your process. And uh, it's, it's been a joy for sure. Um, I, community managers for Green Ronin Publishing, uh, I would fall under that category. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, I want to, I will, uh, Sobel definitely falls under that category. We do mm -hmm. things just a bit differently. Um, I would say our devs as well are, they are unafraid to engage and sort of do things like we're doing now. Um, uh, just to sort of, uh, like hold my hand and we'll jump into the internet and talk to, about to, no, to be no. clear. We're still only doing this because Troy makes us. Yeah. <laughs> that is, that well, is very true. Say on that. On that line of thinking, like panel moderators and mm -hmm. panel moderators mm -hmm. are unsung heroes in, in the gaming world, I would say. 
Yes, especially yeah. the good ones. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers your question, um, uh, Jay, and uh, uh, welcome, Jakarta. Um, we've got uh, more folks joining us. Um, of course, this is Mutants and Masterminds Monday, and we mm -hmm. are talking with Amber Scott and mm -hmm. having all kinds of great conversation. Drop your questions in the chat, and we will endeavor to answer them. Um, and yeah, we're just talking all <clears throat> kinds of stuff. Um, one reminder to folks that this industry is filled with so many opportunities to engage and so many disciplines that might map to your skill set even more um, than than a particular facet. Um, I want something I've encouraged people to do is to really dig into the thing you love to do and find that space and mm -hmm. uh, and and engage. Um, I think. Uh, Let's see, two, two blinks if you're under duress. That's so funny. I can <laughs> I control the camera feed. No. <laughs> I have another like good story kind of about that. Good, yeah. We have being time. under duress? Uh, about being under duress? No. <laughs> maybe I do, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I tell a lot of stories, uh, hence the whole storyteller thing. So mm -hmm. if I ever start to like ramble and be like, <laughs> I've got this great story. Just be like, no, Amber, you've told enough story. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. So I used to think of myself as a workhorse writer. My, mm -hmm. my idea of who I was as a writer was that I was reliable, that I got things in on time and uh, to meet the word count, which starting in magazines, that was a great lesson for me mm -hmm. because with print magazines, you've got no leeway in turnover and you've got no leeway in word count. When I started writing, because it was print, the rule of thumb we had was plus or minus 5%. Mm -hmm. So in a, you know, a 10,000 word turnover, you could go up or down 500 words and that was it. So I'm really good at turning things over on time and to hit the word count. And nowadays it's a little bit more like there's a lot of PDF and digital publications. So I feel like that's a little bit uh, different than when I started, mm -hmm. but I always, undersold my own creativity and my own skill as a writer and you know crystal was kind of like laughing a minute ago saying like oh clearly like you're a really good writer and to hear that you were nervous is a thing but I never really thought of myself as a good writer and people would say oh like you're so good but the behind the scenes from first draft to finished product there are so many people involved uh, from editors to developers mm -hmm. and editors, you know, you've got content editors, you've got mm -hmm. line editors, you've got the developer who puts everything together with, because often you're writing with different, um, a bunch of different writers on the same project. So they've got to like marry all that text together. So it's cohesive. Uh, then you've got the artists and um, there's such a, a wide, by the time the product came out, it often looked vastly different than from when I wrote mm -hmm. it. And I'd always internalize that as like, I turn over like the rough stuff and then it gets made beautiful, but it's better than having no rough stuff. So I still keep getting perk. So this was my attitude up until a couple of years ago. Well, maybe like five years ago. And I got a job writing for an adventure path. And I don't want to embarrass anyone. So I won't say like which path or which writers I'm talking about. We will call mm -hmm. this other writer, Bob. And let's say Bob was like a really famous RPG writer that people really respect and think of as like a super creative person. Mm -hmm. So I got to work with Bob on this adventure path and I was super stoked because I'd never worked with him before. And our adventures came close together. And so we got this mm -hmm. idea that we would email back and forth and come up with some ideas that we would use in both our adventures to create continuity through the adventure path, which wasn't really our job, but whatever. Once you get, you start getting into ideas, it can be hard to like pull that train back. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So we shared all these ideas. We came up with some really great stuff. Uh, my adventure, I think came before his, or maybe it was right. I think mine was right after his. So he mm -hmm. sent me um, his, draft. his turnover and he was like, hey, Amber, here's my turnover and all the stuff I did that we talked about. So you mm -hmm. can incorporate it into your uh, turnover. And I was like, great. And I opened it up and it was, like not great. I mean, it was good. The ideas were, were mm -hmm. fine. The ideas were wonderful actually. And the writing was fine. But it was not the golden brilliance that you were led to expect. Oh, it was like, it was just ordinary. And I was like, is this like the first draft? And I, I went back into it and I was like, no, this is the final turnover. And there were like some spelling mistakes and like some formatting issues. Um, one thing that you can do for all the people out there who want to break into RPG writing, that's mm -hmm. a really easy thing that will make your editors love you. is just get 
a copy of whatever the kind of product is that you're writing and look mm -hmm. how they format things like ability checks, skill yes. checks, yes. Uh, spell names, ability names, like is it capitalized? Is it lowercase but italicized? Yes. If, there, if there's a style guide, please follow it. If there's a style guide, follow it. <laughs> um, because it just makes everything like 100% mm -hmm. easier. So this mm -hmm. fog was like capitalizing spells in Pathfinder and I was like, oh, what is this? And that's when it hit me, it was like a lightning bolt where I was like, wait, everybody is like this. We <laughs> all send over like the rough stuff and then it gets polished and made beautiful at the end. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets the same development tree. I'm actually really good. <laughs> like now that I get it, <laughs> yep. I'm actually kind of amazing. And it was a huge ego boost and it made me so confident in my writing when I realized that everything is a group effort and what you mm -hmm. turn over and that's why I'm so nervous. I think about putting my fiction out there and looking for an agent to represent my novel is because it's just me. Like I, I have a beta mm -hmm. reader or a couple of beta readers and I've got an editor that I trust deeply who's gone over my work for me and yeah. a sensitivity reader. So it isn't just me even then, but it's a lot more me than other projects have been. Mm -hmm. So it's very much more intimidating on that scale. But yeah, what, what you are writing and what you're seeing in a bookstore are two totally different products. Absolutely. So don't judge yeah. yourself. Try and get to be as good as you can. Yeah. Yeah. But those yeah. are apples and oranges. Well, you know, there's there's that expression that, you know, a lot of people who get depressed looking at, you know, people's like great lives on Instagram or whatever mm -hmm. of, you know, you're comparing your, you know, blooper reel of a life to their like polished highlight moments as far as that goes. I feel like blooper reel of a life is just the perfect <laughs> yeah. summary of my existence. You've been reading my diary. You know, I mean, so you can't compare your raw writing yeah. to people's yeah. published text. And even then, I mean, getting to look at other people's working text is probably the best way to figure out your own strengths and weaknesses because mm -hmm as you're going through editing or just like analyzing how other people work, it really teaches you like, what do I notice? What would I have done better? What ways did they do this? That's so much better than how I would have thought to do it. Like mm -hmm. Amber, Amber turned yeah. in a bunch of ideas for this adventure that were just ingenious. You had like a fight in the middle of the adventure that was, I mean, it's important, but it had this really innovative, brilliant idea. I'm like, oh God, this is too good to not use at the end for the mm -hmm. climax. So it, it got yeah. translated and imported over to the end of the adventure and will probably kill a lot of PCs. Sorry, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Right. laughs> a little bit of a killer jam. That's not even true. Well, John brings up something that kind of fits into this, uh, the, the direction we're taking here. Uh, John Polojak says, do you suffer from the problem of having ever cooler ideas occur to you as you're in the middle of a writing project you've carefully planned out already? <laughs> yes. And remember earlier I said that I like marrying business and writing? So yeah. there's a business term that encapsulates that perfectly, and it's called scope creep. Yep. And scope creep kills projects dead. Mm -hmm. Scope creep is when you've got this great plan and then you're like, wait, but it would be cooler if, mm -hmm. and then you spend all this time. I worked on a project once, I won't say what it is because it's unflattering what I'm about to say, but basically we, we had a licensor. So it was important, like it wasn't just an internal project. We had someone to report to mm -hmm. and we reported to them on our status and they were like, you have to change X, Y, and Z. And they gave us like three more months. Mm -hmm. You'll probably see where this is going. Three months later, we had a bunch of new stuff that was not in the original scope, mm -hmm. but we hadn't worked on X, Y, Z at all. Y or Z. And yeah, so cool. At, like there's always going to be a cost benefit. If it's that cool that you're like, seriously, I can't stop thinking about this. Mm -hmm. It's all, it, it can be worth it to go back and like check your outline. And it depends on so many factors. Do you have a deadline? Like, is this an external project? If, mm -hmm. if this is something where I'm writing and it's due in three weeks, I'm not going to email my editor and say, oh, I've got this great new idea. Like, that's just not how I work. If it's yeah. a project that's still being conceptualized and it's six months out, then maybe I'll speak up and be like, oh, actually, mm -hmm. because there's still time to go and change the outline before sure. you put the work into it. Sure. If yeah. it's a personal project, like I just finished writing the sequel to the novel I haven't sold because I'm a glutton for punishment. And like three quarters of the way through, I'm like, wait, 
I just got this great idea. And I did, I went back to my outline and I revised it and I rewrote like half the book because mm -hmm. I had time, like I'm not sure. on deadline, who cares? Sure. Uh, so it's just, yeah, figuring out what your priorities are and what the, mm -hmm. um, what the deliverables are, where, when they have to go out to who and figuring right. out if it makes sense and to outline. Yeah. Sometimes it's like in the doldrums of writing a thing, it's your brain being like, oh, look at this new shiny thing. Mm -hmm. You know, this part of the project is boring. Like, <laughs> I'm going to give you some new ideas to think about. And it's like, yeah, I'm going to write those down. <laughs> but yeah, video games, is now. A, video games is a space too where that feature creep is what we called it. And I actually created a little feature creep looking creep and said anytime that someone's like, I've got a great idea, we would just project feature creep up on the <laughs> wall and say, I love that. yeah, is it being delivered by this character? Um, but some folks here with some comments. Um, yeah, there's, well, I want to, I want to just say real hmm. quick that yeah. like as a developer, you see that sometimes where, oh, God, where yeah. your writer went in and like started putting these ideas in and and you're like this could be a really cool separate adventure or like a cool thing to add to a new adventure so mm -hmm. i always hate pulling those out because they're usually fun great ideas but mm -hmm. yeah yeah and some of them so good they could be a uh, the standalone sort of opportunity for people to to you know in in this case uh for amber to, to kill you um let's yeah. see um some comments here, um, you know, uh, let's see, Danielle says, um, you are the best person. And thank you, Danielle. I'm sure you're talking about me, uh, Danielle. Uh, that's me, right? Um, certainly, um, I'm most certainly talking, they're talking about Amber. Um, Apu says, I'm actually amazing. Yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, a lot of people relating very uh, uh, strongly with the notion of scope creep and the challenges there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Jay Gray talks about putting up I new ideas, um, you know, as for later opportunities mm -hmm. in your big idea file. Uh, yeah. A question I have for you, Amber, is do you have this sort of space or a notebook or a journal or something where you keep just amazing ideas that are kind of incubating? Um, you know, I don't, and it's kind of a weird thing, but I spent so long, uh, working as a, as a freelancer that people usually give me the idea, you know, they give me the, the uh -huh. outline and that's something people don't often realize about RPG writers is that usually you've got an outline that's produced in-house before it comes to you. Yep. So, um, three made one was a little bit different in that. Uh, Crystal was like, do you want to do this adventure? And I was like, it sounds cool. And we had a Zoom call. We caught up on each other's lives and I saw our dogs. And then <laughs> we just brainstormed a bunch of ideas and created mm -hmm. an outline from that. But that's really unusual. Often mm. you will get a fully developed outline from, and of yeah. course it varies from publisher to publisher. Yeah. And then it's yeah. within that, that I would have to be creative. One of the things that i I developed over the course of my career that's also endeared me to editors and developers. So this is like a little pro tip for those of you looking to break in is I've often called role-playing writing like creative nonfiction because mm -hmm. you've got a canon that you have to respect mm -hmm. and you can't necessarily just go wild and come up with all your own ideas because, you know, if I'm writing in, in Forgotten Realms, uh, mm -hmm. I can't suddenly like make up a new god or something like that. So yeah. if I'm using information from another book, I would just comment it into my Word doc and say, I got this from Monster Manual 3, page 82. And if mm -hmm. it's something that I made up, I would comment it in and say, this is something I just made up. And that way, when the developer's reading it, they can be like, oh, this is new content. Oh, this is established canon and mm -hmm. make their judgments from that. And from what I've heard, it's very useful. It's very helpful. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. a, yeah. a really important point as well, that as a writer in this space, it's writing, it's the writer in service to an idea that exists and you're mm -hmm. kind of fleshing out an a, a little story within that canon. That's really important. I think many people think I'm going to be a writer and I'm going to publish my works and that will be wonderful and my own idea. But, you know, writing as it fits into a, a larger IP uh, can have some restraints, but mm -hmm. man, if you're able to do that and kind of crack that code and be a service mm -hmm. to that thing, you're going to get lots yeah. of jobs. But, you know, the other yeah. thing I find as a as a writer too is that having boundaries can actually really be very creatively inspiring. Mm -hmm. You know, I got to do, I got to do the old pulp writer thing recently of, we had a leftover piece of art um, and it was, we need an adventure that goes with this picture. Uh, those. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, and it was like the classic, you know, like here's the cover for Next Issues magazine. Who wants mm -hmm. to write a story about this? Uh, you know, you know my best idea is what I'm constrained. <laughs> right, and sometimes that really gets your creative juices flowing as far as that goes, you know, rather than come up with something. Mm -hmm. And yeah. right now, when I'm like working my way into fiction, because that's like kind of the next hill I want to, or the next mountain I want to conquer. Um, if I write a novel, it takes me like a year. So it's not like I have mm -hmm. to come up with new ideas all the time. Mm -hmm. Short stories are a lot harder for me yeah. um, because I just, like Steve said, I just don't have any constraints. So I'm like, oh, I don't know how to write this. And <laughs> I wind up trying to write something that sounds really profound and it's just like weird and nobody wants to write it. <laughs> <laughs> I love Jay Green says restraints so great um agreed um hey, no judgment no I judgment mean, here none at all as long as you got a safe word uh <laughs> yeah, agreed um preferably something not in German unless you're a native speaker and then it's a real you know um let's see um the most critical oh uh, Apuk says the most critical reader of all myself now finds many defects minor and major but being Fortunately, uh, under no obligation either to review the book or to write it again, uh, he'll pass over these in silence except one that has been noted by others. The book is too short. That's a, a quote from uh, Tolkien. Tolkien is that a, a new um, new kid on the block? J.R.R. <laughs> Tolkien, I guess. I'm vaguely, uh, vaguely familiar. Is he write for Disney? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I think you're right on that. Um, uh, Steve uh, Jonesy says, "Great tip. Thanks for sharing. Um, really." solid advice in all of this and uh and and offering some new facets on stuff that we've talked before and, and sort of expanding on that don't be a jerk and uh, be be a useful contributor um we are wow what is it already almost time to be done <laughs> that can't be true see ever is so charming time literally accelerates around her 100 percent i am uh I, i'm stunned and i'm sad to say that we're going to have to do this for another two hours so um <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so you know before we go i mean we've got um you know folks are are uh are still active engaged and excited and that means that we're going to have to have Am amber back on mm -hmm. every single one of mm -hmm. our uh, meetings clearly <laughs> monday that comes to you 2 p.m pacific um are we ready to do a challenge of some kind? Can I say on? one more thing first? Oh, please do. Uh, if anyone's interested in what I've written or what I'm writing now, I do have a website now. It's amberescott.com. And you can also find me on Facebook. I've got a Facebook author page that's Amber E. Scott. And I won't tell you what the E stands for because I don't want you stealing my identity. Yeah, Chris, I'm looking at you. Stands for and, it says <laughs> your... but, uh, Excellent. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Excellent. Yeah. Excellence, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellence. Um, Literally her middle name. Yeah. Literally. And um, for quality. <laughs> I've just recently started a blog. Uh, I had this idea that I would do a blog when I first launched the website and then I got in my own head and I was like, I'm going to create this great blog schedule and I'll have like three years worth of posts ready before I post anything. And then I never <laughs> posted anything. So now I just write whatever comes into my head. And next month I'm doing Preptober, which is the build up to Nano Remo. Mm -hmm. And the idea is Preptober is you take the month of October to prepare for the writing in November and create the outline for your project. Mm -hmm. And I started doing this about two years ago and it totally changed my life and I love outlining now. So what I'm doing on my blog is I have a poll up where people can pick what kind of book they want me to write. Mm -hmm. And then in October, I'll do a blog series of how I outline it and kind of by the end have a fully developed outline for a book and then maybe I'll write it. So and so this will contribute to the the mimetic entity that is NanoRimo eventually expanding to just take over the entire year. Yes. In one form or another and just you know like, finally assume control of our lives 365 days a year. You know I started doing it in like a long time ago like back when I was living in Seattle so that must have been like 2000 five or something and I never finished it until like two years ago I did it I won for the first time and it was pretty cool so mm. I found it very inspirational and yeah I like it I'm those of you who work. are listening to this on uh or watching this on the YouTubes um Jay Gray our link wizard has also shared um uh Big Mama Scott on Twitter that's me that's you and then um yeah, yeah we've got lots of links Mm -hmm. Our link wizard has really wrangled every link about you. Um, uh, Not everyone, is, I hope. 
uh, <laughs> we'll oh, see. oh dear. Yeah. A couple. Um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> all is well, all is well. Um, well, so how are we feeling about a challenge? Do we want to dive in? Yeah. All right. So Crystal, why don't you describe, um, what super noise fight is all about? All right, so welcome to Super Noise Fight, where the rules are made up and the points don't matter. Um, True that. <laughs> so Troy is about to put up an onomatopoeia of some sort, like you would see in a superhero comic book. Oh, and it is your job to figure out the superpower that makes this sound and the superhero or villain whose power that is, and give us a little bit of information about them. All okay. right, you ready? I love All it, right. yes. Don't be scared. I'm a little scared. Here we go. Do you see? Mm, yes. All right. Now, wh what do you think the noise would sound like? Oh my gosh. This is like my nightmare. <laughs> I'm not good at voices or sounds. It's my That's one- it says on your Wikipedia, message. I know. I can't do accents. I can't do voices. I mean, foazoom, I guess. Right. That's good. Yes. So my initial thought on looking at it, I mean, there's a lot of red and orange. It's got a foie, which is like fiery. So my first mm -hmm. image was firepower. But when I said foie zoom right now, I went like this. And so I kind of sounded like the godfather, like foie zoom. You come to me on the day of my daughter's wedding. <laughs> so now I'm thinking this is actually, and then from Italy, I went to submarine sandwiches. Mm. So I'm thinking that foie zoom is a power that puts like a lot of hot sauce on things. Oh. Mm. And makes things like unbearably spicy. And so like if you're fighting, you can be like foie zoom. And then suddenly it's like you just bit into like a ghost pepper or whatever the kids are eating mm -hmm. these days on those like challenges. On TikTok, that's what kids are on, right? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And it just incapacitates you with this searing, fiery heat. But if I don't have a name for the hero yet, oh, we'll call him the uh the six foot super, <laughs> six foot super. <laughs> if he likes you he can zoom at like a lower intensity and you just get like a pleasant like Szechuan peppercorn kind of tingle mm. and everything is delicious and that's that's how you can tell you've done right I like it. Well, so it does also suggest that that um, uh, six foot super is also sort of maybe a gatekeeper of some kind to pass through this particular thing. Like you get a tasty thing, or you get just your your taste buds burnt out of your mouth. Um, right, like the like the watcher on the threshold in Shadowrun. Mm. So what if or it's you... what if it's kind of like Ghost Rider, where the more sins you carry, the spicier the foisum. Oh, right. I like that. I like that spiciest oh. of sins. You are being oh, yeah. judged. I love it. Cajun super sub, somebody says. I like that. Spicer. <laughs> that's another one. Um, Spicer, that's good. Yeah. Transform, bland to spicy. This is good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, I think you've passed the, the challenge. I, yes, indeed. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> I mean, this is the first sort of taste related um, superpower that I have actually ever really heard <laughs> in my life. <laughs> so, a whole new genre of a hero or villain. Um, and in this case, maybe you are your own villain. So, you know, maybe, you don't wanna... maybe this, maybe the six foot super will have an appearance in a future mutants and masterminds product. Mm -hmm. you don't know. <laughs> well, all I can say is that we have good taste for getting a guest like you to come and hang out with us. What a phenomenal <laughs> time talking with you. And my question, Amber, um, you know, uh, do you, um, would you be willing to come back and hang out and have some fun with us in a future Mutants and Masterminds Monday? Of course. Yeah, that would be super fun. I would love Super it. fun. See what I did there? I, oh, yeah. She is a good writer. Absolutely. And um, uh, I want to thank everybody with the questions and, and sharing their thoughts on uh, uh, Mutants Masterminds conversations. This has been a ton of fun. As always, Crystal and Steve, you make my week. Um, it is phenomenal to hang out with you two. And Crystal, when you bring guests like Amber Scott on, I just got to say, it just makes my Monday even better. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks to everybody. Remember, if you've got thoughts, you uh, uh, want us to talk about a specific thing. There's some questions that you have you would like to you know, share any compliments um, you can do so let's play at greenronin.com we come to you every single monday now i've said this before but i'm a known serial liar <laughs> so next 
stream, I'm oh, going to attempt good. as hard as I can to put together <laughs> our layout so that it looks mm. a totally different kind of a deal. And I'll tell you, we're all of us, um, as much <laughs> as we appreciate Facebook and all the opportunities it affords us, um, we're looking at making this stream a little bit streamier. So, um, so yeah, anticipate, yeah, exactly. I anticipate that we'll be um, utilizing some other services potentially by next Monday. We only have a week, so uh, we'll put all that stuff together. Again, my thanks to Amber, uh, everybody watching. Chris and Steve, we will see you all next Monday. Ciao. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> or will we just continue? No, I'm just kidding. Bye, everyone. <laughs>